Hi, I'm Linda Mal, and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth, and our interviewer, Kay Yoland, speaks with Glenn Kino about his exhibition, Focus, Glenn Kino. Now for Art This Week. Well, thanks, Glenn, for coming in today to chat to us. It's brilliant to have you here. Uh, I thought we could start with you um, telling us a bit about how the concepts of time and space colonization have inspired uh, your work and what it means to you. Well, I think for this project, the, the, um, the engagement is to understand and to create a meditation around our instinct for colonization um, and have that be abstracted through exploration of the notion of space and time. So, for example, um, you know, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the automaton, work, you know, the notion was to, the notion began with this, uh, the creation of um, a phonetic variation, a dialect you know, for the moon um, and, and for Mars uh, that, that could plausibly happen um, after several generations of, of colonization in order to create what I'm calling an artifact of colonization, let's say, in, in, in human scale time so that we can experience it um, uh, when we're alive. because. Um, uh, in, in a historic sense, uh, the effects of colonization um, are immediately sort of encountered through, through the concepts of war. Um, but besides that sort of immediate striking tragedy, the, the, the repercussive um, uh, uh, events and, and sort of changes happen over the course of generations. And, and, and uh, it's my feeling that uh, there's a high degree of likelihood that we, we, through that process, get desensitized to the notions of what these effects uh, are and can be, because uh, we don't actually experience them. We experience the byproduct of them after they're done. And so, for example, uh, in language, uh, when colonial uh, uh, events occur, uh, we, we experience by hearing and speaking different dialects uh, many, many years and generations after the initial uh, moment uh, of violence, let's say, has, has occurred. Uh, in this particular case, um, my, my goal is to, 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 to think into the future and, and sort of um, create what I'm calling a time machine from the receiving end, um, and, and you know, wherein we might experience a, a product from the future you know, coming back uh, uh, you know, in, and engaging us in the present, um, allowing us to create a meditation about our, our, the, the um, the consequences of our actions and instincts, and, 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 and therefore, sort of, you know, somehow fracture and ask questions about what that means and why, why we might we might be engaging. Um, oftentimes, we ask why uh, after uh, things happen, and we have no opportunity to create substantive change. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you know, it's a it's a, a symbolic gesture, but the notion was to to um, create a fracturing of that landscape to be able to think about. Uh, 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 why and causality sort of in anticipation of as opposed to as a consequence of. So uh, that, that's how sort of time plays an element in it um, because by uh, using the imaginary, you know, and uh, the, the context of art uh, to uh, travel through time. I have a small question uh, regarding the languages you chose because I believe that in these evolutions or uh, mutations of how language can shift, um, you were, the first iteration is working with French and English. I yeah. wondered if you chose those languages arbitrarily or whether there was something pointing maybe to the imperialist nature of, of where England has come from and English language conquesting, you know, maybe in fact you go to India for example and a lot of people speak English. Yeah. Were you choosing those languages because of the kind of historical background they already carry? Um, well, yes. I mean, both that as well as, as the symbolic value, right? So, so given that, um, you know, this is, this is a, 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 so a theoretical exercise, let's say, um, it, it was both for that and, and also um, both for what the languages represent, but also, so, um, you know, the, the histories that they carry. Mm -hmm. um, so, so particularly English, you know, mm -hmm. because of its, its power as a colonial device, but also, and I, we, French uh, chose because of um, the inspiration for, for this, you know, partially was also um, uh, the Fanon text, The Wretched of the Earth, you know, and, and uh, you know, understanding and learning um, and, and having that be such a, a seminal fracture and moment in, in post-colonial sort of thinking. So. And I feel like there's a relevance now, even if it's um, a, a tragic accident, but with what's happening uh, right now in France, with what, what's been oh, going absolutely. on, and then obviously France and England used to be 
up against each other fighting. I mean, yeah. France and England now are maybe not the most uh, high-ranking countries, but there was a point when they were kind of, yeah, of out there both uh, conquering. So it's interesting to start with those two and move yeah. back into the future. Uh, let's talk about uh, also your ideas around human violence. I've read that you, the, some of the work may have evolved out of your thoughts or reflections on human violence and perhaps that it's out of our control. I wonder if you could unpack that, um, if you do think it's out of our control. Yeah, why. well, yeah, again, it's a, it, it is a question for me whether it is or in or, or out of our control. Um, I, I would say that we would hope to endeavor that is within our control, um, but I think that it is responsible for us to um, Consider if it is not within our control. Um, so, so uh, a prior, a previous work um, was called Tank, and and what I, I did was I had originally found that the U.S. military was dropping uh, military vehicles and tanks into the ocean as a means of. of uh, uh, Destroying and sort of hiding the detritus of war, and um, what was happening was what I what I considered a, a you know poetic contradiction at the bottom of the ocean, whereas the the um, smallest organisms of the world were reclaiming the instruments of displacement of some of the largest. Um, the the barnacles and corals and fish were were. Uh, growing all over the tanks and restocking dead fishing zones because the fish had places to hide, you know. So the, the government called it and, and deemed it an eco net positive where they were actually felt that they were providing some value to the ocean by, by throwing these rusty vehicles uh, in there. And then years later, um, uh, I happened to get a great generous phone call from a curator asking for a project and um, she supported me to um, cast a military, cast a tank, an M60 tank, into several different pieces. And over the course of two years, we grew corals on the pieces um, and, and exhibited them in, in, a, in several different shows. Um, and what was happening is, uh, we, we, at first we called them living cartographies because the, we, we put uh, corals, which uh, grow in colonies, and they, they sort of began to grow on the coral plates. And then uh, over time, they, they had to compete for space because the, 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 um, the uh, fragment, the fragments, yeah, the fragments were being totally used up. And, and uh, yeah, the landmass was being filled. And, and what we found, um, and also working with a bunch of scientists, is that uh, uh, every evening, uh, the corals would fight uh, at the borders using either mechanical or chemical means. And, you know, in some particular cases, they shoot out stinger tentacles and actually sting each other at the borders. Um, and so, so that became the, 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 the basis of the exploration, which is, uh, wait a minute, uh, it, uh, invisible to the human eye at the bottom of the ocean, colonial creatures that are non-intelligent actors create nation states, fight at, our, at their borders, you know, wh where, where, you know, this resembles something of a much higher, you know, intelligent order. Um, the cycle uh, of violence, but then exactly. could, could you yeah. say that we created the violence by giving them the location <laughs> with the trucks? I mean, I guess not. No, 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 because this happens, this happens happen in nature, anyway. this happens in nature, this happens in the reefs right now. Um, yeah, it didn't happen. It wasn't. It wasn't because of, of, of my project. It was my project was merely, merely illustrating oh, no, no, no. Yeah, and I meant the revealing, trucks. let's yeah. say, um, what what happens. Uh, well, this happens in the barrier reef. This happens in all reefs all around the world. And uh, I, I think that for me, that was a microscopic exploration, you know, and, and representative of, of you know how organisms that are, are again non intelligent behave, but but uh, uh, in striking similar resemblance to the way we behave, you know, on, on the planet. Um, and so so um, given that those are non intelligent actors. Uh, doing it by instinct and, and sort of um, survival, uh, it, it struck me that the behaviors that we are exhibiting um, perhaps are not, you know, super unique uh, to us or to what we might think of a conscious agenda. Right. It also uh, created the rumination that. Um, you know, oftentimes you hear people say, uh, if you could stop war, you'd have peace, and that uh, war is sort of the agitated state. And peace is sort of like the the, the stable state. Um, it, it, you know, for me, there was a reversal of that, you know, uh, thinking wherein, you know, I began to think that perhaps war is the the the, the, the normal state. You know, and peace is the you know state that is is not zero sum. Peace is is the is the state that requires investment and requires like an ag aggressive, you know, uh, uh, and and sort of. Uh, 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 lossy, you know, sort of investment into, so that you know, in order to 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 accomplish peace, as opposed to just uh, stopping war, you know, one needs to make an investment into it um, that that doesn't come at a net gain. You know, we, we live in a culture where um, 
a tit for tat culture. Everyone wants something for what they give, you know. And, and if we if we believe that, um, you know, in that particular case, peace is the default state, and all we need to do is stop like the the, the aggression, then then sort of it it, it perhaps creates a, a route for us that is uh, uh, not sustainable, you know, because um, you know peace is sort of perhaps not sustainable and, and we need to invest in it. So right. um, that, that, that began the, began the um, exploration from a micros, microscopic scale. And, right. uh, uh, this this it was an extension of that, you know, from a macroscopic scale, understanding that um, in space, you know, uh, uh, this planet and, and all the planets are the result of massive interstellar violence, you know, and collisions from, from you know, uh, galaxies and planets and, and sort of uh, ast astral bodies that are, 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 are huge and, um, you know, uh, you know th this project began as sort of a, a change of optics and view. Right, that yeah, and and absolutely, and then you have the uh, violence is defined in different ways depending on the scale. If you're talking yep. that scale, it's more kind of one of physics, I yes. guess, than when we look at human interaction. Let's yeah. talk a bit about yeah. some of the work. I was thinking um, Tears of Maria we could start with. Yeah, we can probably, uh, our audience can probably hear it a little bit right now because it's interacting with the yeah. sun. Yes. Can you tell us about um, the materials you use and how that work was inspired? Yeah, so that, that work, um, so, so technically what you're looking at is um, it is a what I'm calling a portrait of the moon created by the energy of the sun, and and so it's a um, it's a frozen metal plate that freezes to about minus 14 degrees, and um, you know creates a, 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 you know a new portrait of the moon every day, uh, in that the um, ice crystals that form on the surface are, are different. You know, every day, um, it's connected to solar panels on the roof of the museum, and so it draws its electricity from the museum. Um, and, and uh, you know, regenerates itself uh, every day. Um, the black surface uh, surrounding it is a, um, uh, a, a unique recipe uh, for watercolor, actually, that we, we um, got out of the archives and created with uh, charcoal powder and uh, graphite, and it's sort of like this u uniquely dark, uh, 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 you know, mix that, that um, and so every night when the, when the sun uh, goes away, the the, um, the ice melts on the moon and it drips down and carries some of the pigment down with it and onto the floor of the museum. Um, and so, so it's sort of uh, its own uh, ecosystem, right. you know. Um, it almost looks charred, as if there's yeah, sort of there's a charred landscape, some, right? Yeah. As if there's been some forest fire around this white circle. Yeah. Um, is there some sense of kind of tension there then yeah. that they are so opposites, almost fire and ice? Yeah, there was the, the whole thing was out of material tension and sort of the the, the poetics of the the um, interlacing between their their both of their opportunities and, and sort of wills to to exist. And so um, the idea that the the moon, you know, is is only created from the energy of the sun mm -hmm. and weeps for it every night. You know, when the sun goes away. I was going to ask you own. the tears of Maria. Yeah, Maria is 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 a, is, a, is a lunar reference to different like lunar 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 uh, lunar beds and sort of areas of the moon and um, the idea that again the moon weeps for the sun to come back in order to validate its existence and, and sort of create its sort of. Um, you know what the whole 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 work is about, and you know, it's about different access points as well. Because in that particular case, um, you know the the uh, the ice and the resolution for the work, um, since the work is is, is technically uh, about uh, created from a um, a heat exchange, right? So it's a it's a it's a piece that's created by cold. Um, the ice is, is really just the rendering device that allows us to see the cold, you know, that has been created by the heat of the sun. And, um, and, and uh, but the ice is, is created from uh, water vapor that's in the air, you know. So it's literally extracting it from like our surroundings and from nothing, you know, creates creates this uh, uh, portrait. So it's really about the struggle, mm -hmm. you know, for that to exist. You're wishing to physicalize the invisible and therefore yes. make the audience more conscious. Yes. of those things around us that we're moving through the air right now and the different... Yeah, and kind of also the, the entire ecosystem that we live in and in, in, in all the implications. I mean, you know, we, we struggle to, to, for impossible problems like, you know, like, like water, you know, and, and, and uh, it, from California there's a, there's a drought, you know, um, and, and, you know, there are uh, ecological issues all around the world, you know, and, and but again, like you said, it, it's about um, 
creating uh, situations uh, and, and moments for the invisible to become visible and for, for, for people who engage with the work, you know, to again ask the questions about, you know, where does this, where's this water coming from, you know. And it's interesting because we've talked about off camera and on camera about history and looking back and, and you're looking forward at times but you're also very much in the present I feel and when you come yeah. here and you see these things it's very much about being aware of where we are right now yeah so also of, and this is the only moment that we have and yeah. it will affect the future so in that sense you yeah. know, we have to be aware of where we are let's move to the um, to discuss the work behind us okay yeah. um, can you tell us about your choices of uh, using Piero and this idea that you've mentioned before of a trickery or the jester but also the scholar and putting the face of the French philosopher uh, Franz uh, Fanon yeah. onto his face um, and then the various other elements, the interactive. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, complicated and layered, layered, layered uh, uh, work. Um, well, the piece was inspired by me uh, engaging with the classic Pirou in the Moon automaton uh, that was created uh, by and, and restored, actually, not created, um, restored by a friend of mine named John Gong. Um, who was a legendary uh, magic fabricator and, and, and clock uh, clockmaker, um, and, and I spent a, a bunch of time with a few of them. And um, yeah, there's always this amazing uh, uh, paradoxical role that Pierrot plays as sort of the sad, entertaining clown, um, which which uh, I, I I really uh, enjoyed the the, the, the seeming sim seemingly simple simple but actually very complicated sort of you know role um, that fit and and. Uh, you know, in thinking about um, how to create articulations of this language project, you know, I thought it would be it would be great to, to um, create a situation where where um, uh, you know we come to the moon and the moon sang back to you is is a, is a, is a sort of uh, a fun abstraction that sort of just. Um, arrived and uh, but then it's so loaded because we've got the the revolutionary philosopher's face on on top of the oh yeah well and, yeah it's and then you have the music which is a discussion or critique of colonialism yeah but yeah the, the the song is actually a version of uh, the old French socialist theme song the Internationale um, but but uh, uh, sung in lunar French in the dialect that uh, we, we created um, in, uh, by the band Yacht. Um, and uh, yeah, indeed, the, the, the face of the Pirot uh, character is a 3D model printout of uh, the philosopher Franz Fanon. Uh, and, and, and he sings sort of with this ethereal uh, musical you know, gesture um, and his, with coming out of his mind. And, um, it feels so, like so. a mixture of future meets the past and you have the kind of mechanical element of the jaw of the moon yeah. moving down it's quite uh, kind of uh, old school in a way to me yeah of and course then you yeah. Have it's the, old, puppet old, old puppet makers techniques right yeah. but then you have the interactive you know invisible uh, I guess sensors that are able to see how many performers uh, how many audience members are in the room and yeah. that triggers the music so is there a kind of dystopian uh, future and past that you're you're combining or or, or utopian. Or, or, or utopian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, it, I think it's 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 less about um, being being uh, uh, you know in, in terms of the material use of the different technologies. I think it's less about like a you judgment, know, yeah. a judgment, or or a, it's, it's trying to be um, less about relying on the nostalgia of of, of some past, but uh, excited and optimistic about taking a component from the past, taking a component of the future, you know, and 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 and, and authoring. A new, a new um, gesture, you know, uh, in the now. A new I ownership think. of this. yeah, a new ownership of a new, a new fluidity of, mm -hmm. of, of form and engagement. And I, I, I call the work a performance, you know. So it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's again, it's uh, meant to be experienced with with the audience in, in that way. And mm -hmm. um, and why does it have to be at least three? You don't want somebody on their own to engage with the work in a way you want to insist that they become part of a almost a community yeah well because I think that the the implications and understanding of, of the colonial action happens in numbers mm -hmm. um, you know and, and I think that uh, we, we were I was more and am more uh, um, 
interested in, in a dialogue about that. And so uh, when people come and see it in groups, um, you know, it, it, it becomes a conversation, you know, as opposed to, you know, uh, uh, individual engagement. And so. maybe we can also talk about, um, I'm sure you've discussed it a oh, lot, no. but uh, I think our viewers would be interested, uh, the way that you're approaching kit bashing um, and what that yeah, so what? Because I actually hadn't heard of that that term before. Um, yeah, kit bashing is an old model maker's term that that it, it comes from. Uh, I, I I have to spell it. It's K I T bashing. It's the it's a term meant uh, for creating things from a model kit uh, that are that are not from the instructions or, or you know that's the. the the, the history of the term um, and, and uh, old science fiction uh, model makers would take and even nowadays you, you, you would take different component pieces of different models and glue them together you know and make science fiction buildings or make you know spaceships and um, it, it comes from sort of that that practice sort of pre 3d modeling mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, when I when I when I learned the term from a, a, a bunch of old model makers back in early on in when I was in school I thought, oh, this is fantastic because mm -hmm. as, a, as a sculptor it was um, it gave me a, a, a path to think about um, you know assembling this notion of disparate form you know together which uh, was always attractive especially particularly uh, you know, growing up in a, in a with, with postmodernity and this this notion of um, uh, 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 infinitely accessible sort of sense of source material, um, and and uh, you know, I, I began to think about that formally, and then quickly in, into my career, um, that that sort of graduated to become more conceptual as well in my consideration as I realized that I also think of entire systems of production you know as modular parts that I can put into into different works and layer on um, with the goal being to create objects and, and actions uh, that engage and, and ask questions in, in a certain sense of meaning value. And so to that extent, over the course of, of many years, I have uh, used in different cases objects, actions, performance, you know, d d studies and, and, and hybrids, put together. hybrids, but also kind of yeah. a kind of Meccano set of all these different things being yeah, constructed yeah. together. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, with, with no differentiation between like the conceptual or the physical, right. actually. And so, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, entire fields of study, you know, are interlaced and, and layered on top of, you know, a whole different set of formal practice from another, you know, type of art making. And so um, in the, in the uh, uh, you know, diverse, you know, array of projects I've been able to to work on and accomplish. Um, you know, you'll see different layers of, mm -hmm. of you know, story, narrative, and you know, um, technique. You know, all, all together. And so now, now I use the term more more generously. You know, to, to encompass um, you know just the modularity of the way you know uh, my projects sort of become realized. It's so. evolved into something yeah. else, maybe with your specific yeah. trajectory. I'm wondering with the two pieces that are clearly. Um, more conventional kit bashing as far as like oh, yeah. taking out the components. Um, can you tell us, uh, when I first looked at it, it, it almost had a, a very um, kind of glossy and expensive look to it. Yeah. And I wondered how much you played with the original kit. Were, were these very cheap objects that you then like sprayed with silver and gold? Yeah, or yeah. The yeah, they're all off the shelf toys right. um, that have been plated you know, right. in, in, in different metals um, in order to create different surface textures um, that, that have had different uh, engaged meanings, you know, throughout the course of, of my making those series of works. Mm -hmm. Certain times, uh, uh, you know, they, they have been um, all in, in, in uh, plastic, you know, and, and other different types of metals as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, though I will say that, like, when, when they are engaged in the metal, you know, there is a certain, um, conceptual value of the metal that does does uh, inscribe itself into the read of the work mm -hmm. um, that has been a very specific use case you know particularly the ones I've made that have been all gold right. you know, it's really about that, that those have been about um, the, the nature of using gold as a source material right. not necessarily discreetly because of its value but because of what it represents right. in a value economy exactly um, yeah, yeah that's what I'm thinking about yeah I've heard and read that you have some trading in magic oh. and in um, software development. Um, is, is this true? And if so, how does that... I mean, I know you've worked with uh, Napster at one point yeah, and with um, Oprah's uh, it television company? Or? Uh, yeah, well, so my studio is, is, um, is, a, is a very uh, uh, 
diverse, engaged sort of organization. Um, and throughout the, the course of um, uh, my, my career, we, we've been able to engage and work in different types of projects, um, all, all asserting and, and, and sort of uh, interested in, in uh, the overall you know, body of work that we, we produce. Um, but, but I have indeed spent a lot of time studying uh, and, and working in, with uh, magicians in, in the world of magic. Um, that, that work particularly began um, in 2008. I was at Art Basel, uh, and it was a, a sort of horrible year. And, and uh, I, I, it's my first art fair I ever went to. I had I'd sent work, but I had not attended. And uh, I, I, I uh, you know, I was like, wow, these people are miserable, and it was because of 2008 was miserable for most people. But I, I got on the plane to fly home, and I thought, you know, I didn't, while well, I've had some success showing work, I, I didn't sort of get into art making for um, an economic engagement with the market. Um, and so I suspended my studio upon my return to LA, shut everything down, and, and decided to travel around the country and, and, and uh, uh, learn magic, uh, uh, you know, from some of the best magicians in the world as a, as a means of thinking about and understanding um, an alternative value system of belief or, and, and also the nuance of uh, secrecy and value systems that were outside of um, economics, you know, uh, uh, invisible value systems, if you will. And the first uh, thing that happened was a magician, uh, you know, held a, held a coin and he, and he vanished it. And, and he's, uh, I said, well, that's great. And he says, uh, well, I'll teach you how to do it. And he says, go home and, you know, take a coin and, and hold it and you, you grab it a thousand times and come back. You know, and I said, okay. He said, well, what happens next? He goes, well, then I'll, I'll teach you how to vanish it, but you have to learn how to hold it first. And I said, well, I can hold a coin. He says, no, um, you need to learn how to hold a coin you know, when you're performing it, because when you're standing in front of an audience and you make a coin vanish, you have to believe that you're actually vanishing the coin. Despite whatever method we might be able to teach you, you, you have to believe it's happening because nobody in your audience is going to believe more than you. And I thought, what an amazing, beautiful uh, uh, way to think about my studio, you know, which is I make objects that are meant to create meditations on our colonial future. Um, if I don't believe the most that these things are important, uh, who's going to believe more than me? And so with that, I was hooked and I just ended up spending a, a, many, many months um, learning, um, you know, uh, from, from magicians and, um, you know, throughout that process, uh, I met one of the uh, if, one of the best, if not the best, young practitioners, a fellow named Derek Delgadio, and uh, we we formed a, a, an art performing art duo together called A Bandit, and we performed at the Kitchen in New York and a, okay. and a bunch of different uh, places as well. And um, we have we have a, a, a monogram coming up for the for the group, uh, which is really fantastic. And so um, yeah, so we, I've, I've done a lot of work work there and. Um, you know, again, in the studio, you know, because of the nature of how uh, I, I think about cultural uh, conditions, um, uh, I've had the opportunity uh, to be invited and asked by several uh, noteworthy uh, media practitioners to assist them in different projects. And so you know, Napster, indeed, was one of them, and I helped... Uh, uh, you know, I was the chief creative officer there and helped a lot of, you know, different components of its growth. Um, but it's all interweaved, actually, all in and around your art practice. There wasn't yeah. that, and then you became an artist. It was all no. It was always the same. Like you know, excellent. when we when we when we launched the first streaming service, all that whole crew was with me at the Whitney Biennial opening, or you know, when I when I when I uh, when I you know. Uh, was awarded the Cairo Biennale. I think that one of the first conversations I had with that was with Oprah after, and you know, so so it's it's all, you know, weaves back and forth, and it's all it, it was all happening in the same, you know, time frame, and all, all you know, located from the way my my studio model sort of works. So excellent. Yeah. Well, yeah. I have a million questions I can't ask them all, oh, but I guess sure. I would say, do you have any future projects that you can discuss or hint at or? Otherwise, are you... Um, yeah, I have, I have a, a solo exhibition coming up at the High Museum of Atlanta in a few years with the work that I've been doing with Tommy Smith. Um, and then an upcoming solo exhibition at the Indianapolis Museum. Uh, and then and a few other ones that I, I can't, I'm not talking about yet. Okay, but, uh, well, yeah. watch this space then. Thank awesome. you so thank much. Thank you so much. We want to thank Glenn for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to themodern.org. That's it for Art This Week. Thanks for watching.
I still got your polar.